often called the best kept secret in motorsports. It's pure racing. It's speed. It's wheel-to-wheel -wheel action. It's hanging it out on the absolute edge. It's just man and machine. It's karting. The purity of karting can be found in the racing machine itself. A kart's simplicity places it in direct connection and harmony with its driver, as they must act as one to achieve the desired performance. A modern day racing kart begins with a handcrafted steel tube chassis, bent, twisted, and tweaked into a custom design that has taken months of on-track testing to finalize. This chassis is the central focus of the cart, its backbone, its frame. A powerful internal combustion engine is then bolted to the chassis where it will sit alongside the driver to produce an ideal balance of weight from side to side. The final key component to the package are the tires, which connect the chassis and the engine to the ground. This is what ultimately brings the power to the road. And, when the driver settles into the seat, grabs hold of the steering wheel, and engages the throttle and braking control with his or her feet, an incredible connection has been made. All these components become linked. They become one. They are, as one, ready to roll out onto the track in search of the perfect lap, blurring the line between the two as they react in unison to every bump every corner, and every curb. Once the drivers are on the racetrack, all focus is directed on one thing, going as fast as possible. The drop of a green flag, things on the track may get faster, but inside the driver's mind, everything slows down dots are focused. Attention turns to entry point, the line of the apex, the perfect exit where the power is getting put to the track at absolute adhesion. Finely tuned chassis and motors become an extension of the driver's mind and body. When a driver and cart become one, it's a beautiful thing. Racing always will walk hand in hand with speed, but as Richard Petty once said, speed is irrelevant to racing. The competition what it's all about. What, what drew me to karting the most was the competition. There's no other form of motorsports where you can be a whole field within one second. The competition, I think, is stiffer and greater than any form of motorsports, including car racing. I think the closest thing to Formula One is go-karts. Karting is my fix. I mean, it's what gets me through day in, day out. It's what keeps my mind going at work so I don't lose sanity. It's what keeps the drive in me. It's just the biggest passion just to take, you know, engineering and man and put them together 
and just see all the different possibilities and I just love everything about it. There's no bigger thrill than racing and anytime I'm on the track, if, even if I'm not on the track, just getting ready for the next race or preparing is just as much fun because it's all, I'm just trying to keep my mind on it all the time, try to stay focused because I like it that much. The massive adrenaline rush when you drive the go-kart, the g-forces are huge, the ribs, I mean your body takes an absolute hiding, um, but it's the closest thing you'll get to a Formula One car. I remember Nelson Piquet in 09 when he came and raced at Supernats. He said this was harder than a Formula One car. It was so physical. When you're pulling bam, bam, and you're pulling gears and you're going back and it's just such a busy ride, you're holding on for dear life. And I'm telling you, when I put my helmet on, if my wife tells me I want to divorce you or somebody tells me I'm bankrupt, I don't care. I don't. Because it's my time and the cell phone doesn't work. And I think as a racer, when you put that helmet on, it's the best shit there is. Karting is very diverse from its participants to the equipment. Karting's class structure follows some of the same delineations found in any sport. The driver's age is the primary consideration in the development of the ladder system. Classes are separated by the model of engine that is used. The term tag is short for touch and go. An external motor is used to turn over the engine for ignition, which has helped to make these engines quite user friendly. Tag racing is divided into several classes to accommodate drivers of varying ages and weight. The youngest drivers aged 9 to 12, starting cadet before moving to junior. Once a competitor turns 15, they have the option of moving to the tag senior class, which is arguably the most popular category of karting in the United States. It's not just for the young, thankfully, as the master's classes are very popular, attracting drivers 30 years of age and older. While it's fairly easy to, to get up to speed in a modern day racing cart, it may take years to master the talent to run at the front of the pack. This is where racecraft comes into play. The last half second in a quick lap takes much longer to find. Tag carts put much of the focus on a driver's ability to be smooth behind the wheel and to maintain corner speed. And this separates the best from the rest. The shifter cart class is a totally different animal. In America, affordability has become very important in the recent evolution of karting. And when it comes to shifter carts, the Honda CR125 motocross engine has been tabbed as the foundation for the category. In regards to Scusa, they've done something fantastic. They've taken a motor, which isn't even a cart engine, but uh, with the Honda CR125, it's the best gearbox engine in the world, by far. The, the Honda CR125 motor has been a great um, advent for, for kart racing. It's, it's really what's grown shifter kart racing again over the years. It went through a lull period you know, years ago when everyone was trying to do the whole modified engine um, you know, they were built on the edge and blowing up and costs got really high. Well, when this stock Honda program came in and said, hey, you know, let's have a program where all the motors are stock, it's very limited tunability, they're going to be very reliable and have a lot of power, and they're a lot cheaper than it used to be. One, one thing I can say is that on the shifter cart engines, I think the maintenance on it is, is actually less than on, on many of the tag motors uh, because the RPM is limited and it's a controlled stock class, so we're not you know, uh, pushing the outer limits on, on uh, mechanical reliability. For instance, in the S5 class, which is the junior uh, class that's got a restrictor in it, uh, it still makes about 25, 26 horsepower, but it'll do that for hours and hours. The bottom end, you, know, you don't have to worry about rebuilding that for at least 40 hours, and the, the top end, uh, you can go 10 hours easily on it and still be you know, making good power. It's basically stock. There's a couple things that you can do to it, you know, trackside tuning and so forth. 
Um, it's very reliable. I personally, in I think six years of racing stock Hondas, I've never blown up a stock Honda, ever. I've never seized a motor. Um, I've never had a problem with reliability. I've pushed them really close to, I mean, I've been on the edge as far as lean edge, and you know, the worst I've done is a little detonation on a piston. You know, it, it just bodes well for the stock Honda engine itself and what it's done for this class. I can, you know, back in the day, you, you know, with the ICC motors, you used to have to take them up, like send them back to the motor builder, have them rebuild the bottom end every five gallons of fuel or whatever it is. You know, these stock Hondas, you know, I, I had a motor that went two years on the bottom end and nothing was wrong with it. And I just went ahead and said it's time before I do have a problem. It's so easy to run. It makes incredible power. Um, it's not too expensive for the racers to, to keep it running. Um, and it's the best. If you go to Europe, it's not even available. Um, they don't run this anywhere in Europe. Um, the only place you'll find one of these in Europe is, is on a Honda motorcycle somewhere, and, and that's it. And, and because of that, the, the class has grown exponentially over the years. It's, it's almost like it used to be in the heyday of shifter kart racing. And now the Scusa Super Nationals is the largest kart racing kart race in the world. It's amazing. It's all because of the stock Honda program and what it's done for the sport. It's a six-speed monster with a unique exhaust screen and incredible performance. Just like TAG, the shifter kart classes provide a place for all those looking to bang gears. The engines are affordable and kept in stock form, they are virtually bulletproof. And the racing is hardcore and incredibly close. I like the Scusa class structure because they offer kind of an avenue for guys like me that are getting older and we have to go to work on Monday and we're not karting every weekend. Um, I, I was lucky, I probably raced 15 times last year, it's quite a bit. Um, but compared to the guys running, say, S1 and S2, those kids are sometimes in a kart every weekend, some of the top pros in S1 are in a cart multiple times a week, every week. S1, it don't get any harder than that. It's fierce. I mean, two tenths, three tenths could be 10 positions, 12 positions, 15 positions, I mean, depending on the quantity of uh, drivers. But yeah, you, you breathe wrong, you twitch wrong, your leg moves the wrong way on the throttle pedal, two, three, four positions. So you gotta be on your game, you gotta be focused, and you're ready to roll. And so classes like S4 allows guys like me to still have fun and, and race competitively. The talent is there. Uh, Bonner Moulton, all those guys, Chris Jennings, uh, all the guys who run at the front in, in S4, if they were driving every day or a couple times a week, would be competitive in S1 or S2. Uh, matter of fact, Bonner ran at the front in S1. He finished second at Utah. So it proves that the S4 guys are competitive. So it's a neat structure. you got S4 with older guys down to S2 where you have people that maybe are, like most of them are younger. Well, S2, is a great class because you know it gives that opportunity for people who want to move up to that next level to do so without having to make a big jump or a big you know risk jumping straight to the S1. Um, also I think it's, it's a great class because it gives a lot of us opportunity that who maybe aren't as fast as them to be able to be able to race and also be competitive maybe not as fast but still be able to be there. It's always about those steps and I would love to go you know S2 get into S1. Start small don't freaking go out and spend ten thousand dollars on a you know and get the biggest and baddest whatever because believe me it's nothing like it looks i mean you you know especially adults they love oh hey i want a 125 i got a 911 porsche i can drive i go dude it's not even the same i go you go start out small get a get a rig get a clutch car then work your way up to a shifter car 80. then bring work your way to a 125. don't just go and grab a 125. I mean, I drove carts for years, and it took me over a year to learn how to drive a 125 competitive. And I had been driving carts for years, because I thought, oh yeah, I'll just get that one. All it is is faster, six-speed gearbox. Totally different ball game. I mean, S1 is very cutthroat. That's the best way I can describe it. Uh, it. A lot of the fast S2 guys would get pushed around a lot in S1. Probably wouldn't be competitive. So they need to get a chance to learn how to race at the front in S2 before they take the step in S1. S1, man, the... It's nearly impossible to pass. It is so much harder to pass than uh, the S2 semi-pro class. You're running a lap time, there's probably 10 guys in S2 that can run the same lap times as the S1 guys, but over the course of a race, the S2 guys are gonna get shoved out of the way by the S1 guys, and it takes a year or two of learning to do the shoving carefully without actually taking someone out and racing them hard. And I think that's what S2 does, is it prepares you for that nature of S1, 
And so it's a neat structure. I think the, that it works pretty well. Every go-kart you can tune to win. Every driver you can push. No, but like I say, start small with your kids. Don't force them into it. Just go ahead, buy some of these used stuff. I mean, you don't have to go out and get everything brand new. I mean, there's, that's the biggest thing. You know, you see a lot of these parents that go out and they spend, you know, thousands of dollars and they go buy, you know, top of the line, great stuff. Kid gets in the car, drives it once or twice and get, just loses interest. And I think it really comes down to drivers. It's not as much in the Formula One team. You're not spending a billion dollars or whatever it is to go fast. You can go out and buy a go-kart that's two years old and go out and win on it. I mean, me, when I started out, I mean, I bought carts for my kids. Yeah, I did buy brand new kid carts, but I mean, it was only a $1,200 investment for each, you know, each one. So it was like, not a big deal. But I was like, hey, is this what you, you want to do? And freaking, you just encourage them. Hey, if they're freaking not happy with it, then hey, don't be afraid. Just go, okay, fine, this is just not our deal. But uh, luckily, both my kids were, hey, yeah, this is what I want to do, so. I mean, like I said, I have, I've, I've had so much fun, and I mean, you can't put a price on a good time, and this is what a really good time. I mean, I, I work extra just so I can do what I do with my kids. So, but I mean, like I said, it's a fun deal. Racing is like a high-speed chess match. The sharpest mind will generally win. In karting, however, the driver with the sharpest mind has only won half the battle. The time spent setting up and fine-tuning these machines for a unique collection of sweepers, hairpins, and chicanes that each track provides is unparalleled. Every track presents a new set of challenges and complications that drivers and teams must master. Finding the ideal balance between grip and corner speed is key. I guess a lot of people think that you know you just you mash the pedal down and, and you go. It, it's so much more than that, especially with carts, because of how how they articulate that. Um, a driver has to consider Ackerman and towing and caster and camber and gearing and and, and so much. Even how much grip is on the track, um, weight distribution of their body even in the seat. I mean. It, it, it's impressive because there's no suspension or anything else, um, but there's so much to it that you don't see when you just watch them as they're going around the racetrack. The most significant difference between a cart and a traditional race car is that a cart has no suspension. As a result, the setup of a cart is dramatically different. A cart team relies on the flex in the chassis to do the work that you would normally look for from a race car's shocks and springs. It's a black art, really, with uh, you know no suspension. So you're just trying to get the, the the metal, the flex, as good as possible, and and work out what grip levels you have, you know, and, and either trying to find grip or get rid of grip. You know, very rarely do you just pull the cart out of the box and put it on the track, and away it goes. It's um, you know sometimes it's as easy as that, but you know. It, it's quite a, you know, they're all little small adjustments. But, you know, when initially, you know, putting the thing on the track, having some fun, that's the way to go. But the preparation of the go-karting, like I said earlier, it's a, um, it's, a, it's a black art with these things. And, um, you know, trying to get the right advice isn't an easy thing either. So you, you learn, it's a bit of trial and error. But, um, but at the end of the day, it's, it, it's fun. It's a big learning curve. If you think about it, we only do seven laps of practice during one session, and then we'll work on the cart for an hour. So, I mean, what's that calculated to? I mean, every time you're on, one minute you're on the track, I mean, how many hours do you have to spend on it? I don't know. But uh, it's pretty impressive, you know, all the mechanics and how, how detailed they get, and everything is just extremely precise, and because and everyone's trying to get everything to the last point, you know, of just trying to make everything perfect. So it's, it's pretty impressive to watch all the mechanics and also the drivers having to be physically fit. And, you know, it's not just one thing that you just show up and, and start doing. You have, to be, you have to be mentally prepared. You have to be physically prepared. And also the mechanics have to be prepared to, you know, to have different situations and 
conditions of the track where they need to be able to, to read the, the tires and everything. So, it, like I said, it, it's extremely simple when you look at it from outside, but then when you get inside, it's extremely complicated. One would be hard pressed to find anything on these carts that is not adjustable. From carburetor slides to tire pressures, axle thickness to seat position. A half pound of air in the tires or the wrong jet in the carburetor, this can be the difference between winning a race and even being able to see the top three finishers as they cross the finish line in front of you. Chassis ride heights, rear end width, and Ackerman adjustments all have monumental effects on the handling and feeling of how a cart drives and performs. Should you miss on any of these adjustments in a competitive field, you can be sure to have lost time on track. Time in racing is measured in thousandths of a second. This could mean the pole or it could mean mid-pack. Yeah, the, the tuning is very important. Uh, tuning is a huge part of kart racing and, and a lot of people don't see it at first. Uh, at first, drivers just want to think about driving. They just want to think about how quickly they can get their foot back on the throttle, uh, how late they can go into a corner. Uh, and that works awesome. That works great. And uh, they'll be very, very successful at the lower levels, uh, at club racing, at regional racing, uh, this, type of, this type of thing. Uh, but once you start getting to the higher levels of national racing, you start to realize that every driver there is very, very fast. Every driver is very talented. And then you start getting beyond the point where just driving can help you to win races. Then you have to start relying on a, a fast cart. Uh, and and uh, there's tons of details in the cart. Uh, it's the motor, it's the chassis, it's the tires, it's the tire pressure. And, and all of these things add up. They're all very, very important. They're all important part of the performance equation. And so um, being a great driver is fantastic and uh, good talent will take you a long way. But when you get to the biggest races, you're gonna face other drivers that are very, very talented. And to compete with them, you have to be perfect as a driver, but also the chassis has to be perfect. The motor has to make maximum power and the, the tires have to give you the best grip. Uh, and then you can win a race. In a sport that crisscrosses the country and where travel is counted in miles at a time, millimeters can be the difference between being the first to see the checkered flag and being far back in the field. A lot of it was done like see to your pants, like feel, you know, like um, you, you would tweak the carburetor or something like that, go out, run some laps, come back in. and and then try to debrief the driver and say, you know, how, how did the cart feel? Did, did it feel like it had more to it or, or less, you know, on the top end? Um, whereas, you know, now data has taken a quantum leap forward as far as what they can do and what they can record and monitor and how they use that to, to, to truly confirm those, you know, maybe guesses at what needs to be done with regards to, to setup. If you can measure it, Odds are that someone in karting already is. Every kart on the grid at any major race has a small computer on their steering wheel connected to a black box that receives and processes all telemetry. For the most part, this technology helps drivers keep an eye on the specifics of the engine, but it also shows them their lap times and provides assurances to the tuners that their adjustments were either spot on or that more wrenching is needed. With the impact of technology, top karting teams now have sections of the pit areas dedicated solely to data acquisition. The uh, Micron's been a great device to really help out with data on the track and also off the track. Uh, whenever you know I'm on the track, I need to know if you know the motor's getting too hot so I can make adjustments to the radiator. I need to know what RPMs I'm pulling down the straightaway. Otherwise, you know, I won't know if my gearing's correct or not, or if I'm pulling enough revs down the straightaway if I need to rejet the motor. Um, you can also do EGT with a Micron, so if you really want to get on that really close lean edge to be able to really read the jetting, then the, the EGT is a great way to go with the Micron as well. Um, the Micron also has some great features as far as off-track data. You can plug it into a laptop and you can look at your laps. It has GPS on it, 
you can actually look and see what driving lines you're taking in the corners. You can actually see what parts of the track that you're faster. You can also overlay data with friends or other, other competitors and see who's faster where and why. Is it the chassis setup? Is it your driving? Is it your jetting? Data has been, become such a critical part of any of these racing programs out here um, because everything is so close and every, I mean even the, the most small adjustments can mean tenths of a second out on the track. So data has become more critical than ever, both on the driver side and on the tuning side. Um, I mean, uh, they're, they're using that to develop their drivers from a young age all the way up until adults. And then, uh, and then also on the tuning side, they're using things like AFRs and Lambda, RPMs and speed to determine optimum cart setup. The importance of data acquisition has increased dramatically over the past decade or so and has secured a foothold for all the top teams across the country who understand that lap after lap, those tenths of a second start to add up quickly. Putting on a, uh, a karting event, a karting race, is, uh, is a big challenge on many, many levels. It, it takes insanity probably to do something like this. This is just, uh, it's eight months of preparation for 95, 98 employees. You know, it's, it's a big task. It's huge. It takes teamwork. And uh, I just got an incredible crew. Uh, so, I mean, it just takes a lot of you know, people that care. And what you find is that those people are really selfless. They do it because they love it. Um, they work all kinds of hours. Um, they probably don't get a lot of thanks. And um, so the first thing it takes is a really great team. And that's what we got here. You can see the guys on the track today. I mean, it, and I got a gazelle running back, jumping over carts. I mean, it, it's amazing uh, what these guys do. Um, it just takes um, tons of dedication. You know, all these guys are hand-picked, okay? This is not your local little worker that's going to show up. I fly them in from St. Louis, Utah, Minnesota, all over. They're hand-picked. This is the event they want to race and do, and uh, they're the best. You know, I mean, we used to have, back in the days, they used to have a Scusa 18. This is the new Scusa 18. It's, you know, just phenomenal bunch of guys and girls that get it done. 
you know, the, the next thing it takes is, is a neat venue. I mean, racers want to race with a lot of other competitors. And, you know, that's why Scusa does such a great job is they've created this deal on a parking lot in Vegas where 500 race, racers show up and want to race. And so finding an, a venue like that and creating something that's interesting to Carters is what it takes to put on a great race. I just love this shit. I mean, I love it. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I dig it. Yeah, you, know, you can feel it. Your hair kind of goes up like this, and the lights come on, and we got 45 going into the first turn. It doesn't get it better than that. I mean, it's just, uh, that's, I think that's the uh, satisfaction when I'm done here. It's almost impossible to put a price on experience. But for those who are new to the sport, there are ways to accelerate the learning curve. No matter what direction you go, you'll have 10 other people telling you, you need this part, you need this part, and people spend thousands of dollars on, on buying all these pieces and stuff that they think will make them faster, when the fact is, is they need to fix what's right in the middle of the cart, right in the seat, is the driver. Somebody new into karting, you can knock off seconds in a day or two. And, um, you know, so you can, you can save yourself a lot of money getting some proper training to make sure that you're doing everything right as a driver before you try to throw axles at it and hubs and engine parts and all this stuff. You want to make, right? Because 100% of the braking zone, 10,000 RPMs, the 34 horsepower on this thing, how you're going to use first gear. We're going to set up a little oval for you guys and get a chance to go out. Because as a driver, if you're not if you're not on the right driving line, if you're not braking at the right time, if you're not coming off the brakes at the right time, if you're not accelerating at the right time, if you're not hitting the apex at the right time in every single corner, every single lap, well then nothing you're going to do to your go-kart is going to fix that. You'll be way ahead of the curve if you come get some training right off the bat instead of spending a couple years, you know, buying parts and trying to make the cart better when what you need to make better is the driver. There are many who like driving a cart to a motorized ballet. Finesse. The balance quiet hands on the steering wheel. These are all needed to achieve a fast lap. But taking a cart to its limits, or just beyond, can also be akin to riding a rodeo bull. Some tracks are just rougher than others. Level of grip from the rubber that is laid down can be unbelievable. It's a wild ride, a physical sport, of that there is no question. When I get out of a race weekend, you know, I go back to work, I'm an engineer, and. The guys are, oh, you've been gone for a week vacation. I'm more mentally exhausted and physically exhausted from a week of karting than I am, you know, engineering and I'm doing math problems all day. Karting is way more exhausting on all fronts. Carters don't just battle other drivers on the track. They battle the physical and mental fatigue that can come from wrestling a machine for 25 laps. Driving a top-line racing cart is a workout. There are incredible physics that are in play. Drivers must withstand anywhere from two to three Gs of side load during the course of a race, and the physical toll that this can put on a pilot's body during the event weekends is truly tough for those to comprehend if you haven't actually experienced it yourself. Uh, people just think there are fun carts, but I train six days a week. Um, I've done P90X Insanity. Uh, i got my wife doing it. And if you're not in tip-top shape, you will feel it every day you're not going to be well behind the cars. You can treat it as a fun cart, but you'll be in the back. It's a workout, and racers thrive on it. Arm and chest muscles are put to the test during each session. Drivers' backs and necks are strained, and they take a constant beating every time they hit the track. And when you roll back to the pit area after a session, it's funny how it all seems so worth it. It takes an immense amount of mental strength to pilot one of these machines. Drivers must have incredible mind control. 
to stay focused on passing directly by the apex of each corner. A target that can be the size of a quarter. Hitting that mark. Lap after lap after lap. While karting does not possess the same level of danger associated with stock car or formula car racing, it still carries its own set of risks. In motorsport, we do everything we can to make it as, as safe as possible. Everything from the, the way the carts are constructed, the, the circuits, the way the circuits are built, the, the helmets we wear and the driving overalls and, and this type of thing. But at the end of the day, every driver has to acknowledge that they're getting in a very fast vehicle, even, even a young driver. And uh, so even though everything's been done possible to make it as, as safe as possible, um, you know, things happen. Um, things, uh, things happen when you're walking down the street. Uh, things can happen when you're uh, driving to work in the morning. Um, and it's, it's a reality of the sport because when you're racing at speeds of uh, 100 miles per hour and there's 39 other people next to you doing the same thing, fighting for the same ground, the, the inevitable is that they're going to come together sooner or later and um, it's just a part of the sport and it makes you realize that uh, you're alive and um, you better appreciate it every day because uh, you hope it's safe, um, but there's no promises. Um, so it's, it's a reality of the sport. Well, the last thing we ever want to do is throw a red flag, you know. It's, it's kind of voodoo for us to throw a red flag, but it, it, it's required. The one that will always stand, stand in my mind for this race is the one that we had last night where the gentleman, you know, went over up the water barrier in turn three. Basically what happened is I got pushed wide going into the corner, and coming out of the corner I tried coming back in, and I bounced off of one of my teammates and it sent me into the wall and I hit the wall and it just sent me flip, it, it just flipped me in the air. You know, it, it is a sport, but you'll see some of the ugliest crashes where guys are flipping and everything, they hop right up. Uh, I didn't see until I was driving the track, checking it last night for, for damage, the black, black line that went up that water barrier. And I mean, it just blew my mind. I've got bruises just on my back, but necks not sore, no broken bones, no broken hands or anything. Anytime you're out there, something bad like that can happen. I've been pretty fortunate. I haven't had any bad injuries. I haven't got upside down, you know, knock on wood. But yeah, there, there's still risks. But um, you just shoot your head and be smart and you usually come out all right. It, you know, in any, any form of auto sports racing, there is a risk. But it's a pretty safe sport. They're getting these good barriers out here now. So when you crash, the barriers wrap around you, protect you from other cars hitting you. My big thing, I never want to ever see a go-kart go by a person that's laying in the track and have to have listen to a go-kart go by. It's something I pride myself on that that never happens. When you're in the track with all the professional equipment, with the professional people, like all those uh, marshals up there, the, the sport is, is, is safety. I go racing like 40 weeks a year and I maybe see one or two broken arms. Motocrossing, I've seen it every motocross race. People were getting taken off in the ambulance and uh, a few of those times it was me getting taken off in the ambulance and uh, I, don't, I don't miss that at all. I've seen some pretty, what looked like some pretty horrific accidents and people walked away with not very bad injuries and I think that's sort of the norm and the rule. I think the, the tracks and the, the race staff these days do a really nice job of minimizing the danger. Honestly, I don't even think about the risk of karting. I mean, I don't think of the risk of when I race anything. I mean, if you do, you're going to hurt yourself. I mean, if you're thinking about going through a corner wide open, Rock Island or, or Supernats and there's a barrier and there's a wall, if you're thinking about what's going to happen if you crash, you're going to crash. You're nothing about racing. So I honestly don't think, and I've been asked that a lot, is that you don't think about your own safety. You don't think about what could go wrong. Because if you do, you actually will crash. 
I think that's what happens with amateurs. You know, you see a lot more amateurs getting hurt in, in motorsport is because they're thinking about how they can get hurt instead of focusing on what they're doing. So I don't think it affects me, but it's almost like it, it's almost as if because of what it is, it doesn't affect me. I just don't even think about it. You just can't. The moment you start thinking about getting hurt is the moment you're going to probably get hurt. So in my personal opinion, it doesn't affect me at all. With modern equipment and, and um, a little caution, most people go through karting careers and aren't hurt bad. Everything is dangerous. I think this is very safety sport. If you follow the regulations, and if you discipline your kid and talk about the dangers, I think every, every sport is dangerous. To me, this is safety. Because when you're doing the right thing, when you're doing everything like talk with your kid and tell him what to do in the track, it's, it's really safety. So what makes normal boys and girls men and women slip into a racing machine set an inch off the ground to run 80 miles an hour plus around a racetrack it's the quest for outright speed the search to determine who is the fastest over a span of a 20 lap main event this is part of the definition of racing it's what racers love to do but it comes with a certain level of danger And racing of any kind, karting included, when you make an error, the stakes can be much higher. In the search for more and more speed, this level of peril is also increased. Unfortunately, one can truly not be had without the other. You know, some of the best friends I have are in karting. You know, we're all we're all striving for the same thing, and that's to win. Um, but that, but at the same time, um, you have to win, but you have to be respectful of the other people you're competing against. It's funny because you're uh, on the track. You could be enemies while you're on the track, but then you come off the track, and everybody's there to help you. They, everybody wants you to go faster. They can help you give advice, especially when you're just starting out and you really don't know what, where to go, what to do, tire pressure, or anything. Now I can just about change my own piston <laughs> uh, 
I can work on the car, change gears, axle. There's hundreds of people out here, and if you treat somebody with disrespect, and you need something from them, they're not gonna give it to you. So you have to treat your competitors with respect. You have to treat them the way you wanna be treated. So we all end up competitors, yet we're friends at the same time. I meet a lot of like cool friends at the Supernats every year, just new kids. Yeah. You know, the, the friends that are close, you know. I want the best racers, the best hardest racing, rock and roll, good barbecue, a cold beer, and family fun, and sending any, everybody home with a smile. And, you know, that's really, I mean, and it's American racing. We, for, for years and years, everybody's trying to, hey, try this motor, it's the new thing from Italy. Everybody is tired of getting something shoved down their throat that's the newest and the greatest. Now it's simple, you go down to your local Honda store, you pick up a piston, and you go race. I mean, you know, anytime you, you, you get a compliment, and that's the nicest thing I think. You know, people just stopping you out of the blue, introducing their son to you and saying, this is Tom, you know, this guy puts it on. People just high-fiving you, giving you hugs when you walk to your room. It's like, you know, then it's worth it, right? The karting community can be described in many ways but one word that seems to stand out the most is family. Karting was, is, and continues to be built on the shoulders of families. At its foundation, karting owes much of its strength to the passion and dedication of families. The majority of the kart clubs around the country are headed up by the parents of racers, all volunteering their time to ensure that their children have an enjoyable experience in the sport that they love. Well, it represents everything. It's, it's, um, it embodies all the dreams that my son has for his future. So it's, it's really been an interesting kind of journey um, coming this far and watching him progress through the sport. So I'm living vicariously through him. I feel like my dad's and I relationship is much stronger because of racing and my whole family is involved. My sister works for Scusa, my dad comes to all the races, my mom usually comes to all the races. So I feel like uh, karting has really brought my, my family together in a, in a lot of ways. My grandparents' parents were drivers and then my grandparents were drivers and my dad was a driver and my mom drove before. And then my brother's kind of a driver and I'm, and I'm a driver. That's how it got me involved. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's totally a, it's like a, you just get a big extended family when you're out here, basically. I mean, we're from California and when we race, club racing, doing stuff like that, I mean, it's like one big family. I mean, everybody knows everybody's kids, who's supposed to be with who, you know, it's, it's just like you have a big extended family. Since their invention, automobiles have played a unique role in the family dynamic, bonding people together, car keys getting passed down to the next generation, year in and year out. Racing is just an extension of the shared passion. It just brings family closer together. It's the best family sport I've ever been in. I grew up playing football, soccer, baseball, 
all these different sports. And what generally happens is the parent, <laughs> the parent, the parent uh, drops you off the baseball field. You go practice, and if you're lucky, they show up your football game. Here, the family has you for the whole weekend. You do your traveling together. You're with each other the whole time, so you really get to really understand what your children are. The accessibility to the masses brings in racers of all ages, and this lends itself to the family atmosphere. It's a team effort to find success, and it's an incredible opportunity unlike anything else in sport. It's family working together to solve a problem and then sharing the success in the journey. It's great being with the team because, I mean, there's a lot of support and it's really great because you can help everyone and they help you and it's almost like a family. And it's just, I think it's a great experience to be able to make those relationships as versus being by yourself. It's a little harder when you're on your own and you don't really know what you're doing and you don't have that extra help. I think being with a good team is one of the best things that you can have in it and it plays a huge role in how successful you are. I think, uh, I think racing teaches a lot of life values. I think it, it helps a kid understand how to win and lose in situations and builds character and helps you deal with adversity. I, mean, I, I think it really helps a kid grow uh, at, at a really, an earlier stage in life if you get him started early. Like my, my son's eight and he can deal with a lot of life situations better than many adults. Yeah, you know, and it's amazing, some of these kids they get into it because their dad's racing and their, the wives make them take the kids to the track. So they, they throw their kid in a cart and they just have this natural ability. And they, some of them just right out of the box. They're fast and they know what to do and uh, it's incredible. I love watching the kids race. We, we have a lot of memories. Um, you know, like, of course, winning is a, is a good memory. Being in the top three, top in the podium is a good memory. So we have a good memory, not only in the track, we got memories when we're traveling here in the middle of the road with our family. We have memories everywhere. You grow memories in the track with the people around, so. Well, my dad, he used to race professionally um, all over the world. And he basically was like my mentor at first. And that's who brought me into it. And that's what my idol is, sort of. It's really fun because your family comes out, supports you, and watches you. And as soon as you come in, they congratulate you or tell you you'll do better next time. This morning, we got up at four o'clock in the morning to come to Vegas to come to a parking lot and go go-kart racing, you know? So the whole family just gets up, they get in the car and they go. So it's definitely, it's definitely a family affair. We all have to be going the same direction, have the same attitude, and the same uh, you know, drive to come out here and do well. Driving across country, you learn a lot about yourself and your friends and everything, because you have time to talk about things you normally wouldn't talk about. Uh, kind of related to traveling, one of the, the coolest things I ever got to do was with Chris, actually, is before he even started racing. This is my first major race at Rock Island. The Friday that he's supposed to leave, Jordan calls me up and says, hey, you know, I really want to go to this race and I can't do it by myself. You know, is there any way you could possibly come help me out? And, you know, I, I was working all day and I said, you know what, let's do it. We, we were borrowed a friend's Suburban, so I didn't have any way to actually take my go-kart to the races at the time. We loaded it up in the back of uh, this Suburban and drove through the night, I mean, 13 hours straight through as fast as we could. We showed up about an hour and a half before practice started. We slept on a park bench for two hours because you know we didn't want to check into a hotel for a couple hours and uh, you know woke up to people walking around on the street next to us and you know knew that's time to get up you know we went out there and raced and he was initially pretty fast he's he's progressing up and then next thing I know I see a cart come flying around the corner and straighten the hay bales and I realized it was Jordan it's like oh no so sure enough he he wadded up the front of the chassis and you know we brought it back and he said you know we could just go home now and, and call it quits and you know just get a get a head start get back early you know I, and I, I, I told him hey I didn't drop all this, all this way just to see you quit early and leave so 
let's uh, let's make this work. So we grabbed a hammer, we started beating on the chassis, we started straightening up as the best we could, the best that we could, and you know we went back, went back out there and qualified decent and ended up winning the race. So to like have that experience with one of my best friends, travel to race in the back of suburban, racing against people that are out of 18 wheelers, sleep on a park bench literally the night before, uh, and then go out and win, load back in our you know suburban, borrowed suburban, and head back home. Uh, it, it's really hard to, to express what that felt like, that overall. And that whole experience of being there with him and helping him out and, and, and seeing the past time that I really had, had not been able to get into that I really wanted to, to do made me just give me that last shove that I really needed to make sure that I did whatever it took to get into karting. It's a simple fact, the racers race. And they understand that sometimes things can go wrong when you're fighting for that same piece of pavement side by side at 100 miles an hour. The camaraderie and sportsmanship found in the pits cannot be matched by any other sport. Traveling together, racing together, winning together, and losing together. This builds a strong bond. So strong that it ties together the men and women who race these machines closer than any minor wreck could ever pull apart. It's incredible. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can go to the park you know, you can do things like that, but this is so special and you're coming out and you're actually teaching your child something, you're spending time with him, you're bonding. Um, to me, this is something that will last forever. Karting is, um, karting is a little, kind of a little hidden secret in motorsports that most people don't know about. Yeah, karting is a, it's a hidden gem. It's, karting is a hidden sport. Um, the, the truth is, though, it's just very difficult to, to get involved with it. You, you must know somebody um, that's involved. Uh, it's, it's hard to find uh, hard to find tracks unless you know precisely what you're looking for. And until you've been to that track, you don't know what you're looking for. Sometimes you see people um, that do overcome that. And they tend to be the, the very, very best drivers in the sport eventually. Um, the fact is, is, is almost every IndyCar driver, NASCAR driver, Formula One driver for sure, all started in karting. Some of the names that you see here this weekend, I promise you will be in IndyCar Formula One within the next few years. It's just the way it works. Because they're the ones that overcame the most hurdles uh, to getting involved and so they can just as easily overcome um, you know, more obstacles uh, within the sport. But uh, it is a tough sport to get involved with, especially for somebody that's never, uh, never been involved. It, it, it's kind of perplexing why it hasn't become bigger. I think part of it is almost a stigma. When you go and talk to some about karting, at first they think the, the you know, free carts, or I mean the rental carts that you do at Speed Zone or something like that. And then also the stigma of karting being a, a cart and it's a toy. They don't see how that could be something you'd want to spend tens of thousands of dollars on and travel around the country versus a racing machine that can give you performance basically second only to a Formula One or an IndyCar. If you're not a kart racer, you don't know what a race kart is. The biggest problem that I see is that most people don't know what karting is. If you're not already involved in motorsports, you've never heard of a race kart. If somebody mentions the word kart or go-kart to you, you're thinking of a 25 mile an hour concession kart. Um, when you say to somebody, you know, a real, a real race kart goes from zero to 60 faster than a Corvette, their mouth drops, they don't believe you. I think that's the biggest problem is we need to sell the sport as a racing machine that is 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 100 mile an hour racing machine versus a, a cart. I mean you can't rename it, it really is, it's a go-kart. But it, it's, it's hard to separate yourself from the rental cars when you talk about it. Almost everyone that's driven one is, is uh, perplexed by the amount of power it makes and amazed and how fast it is. The biggest problem that I see as far as growing karting is we need for the public to understand what we do. That's why I think it's worth the time and the trouble and the money and the energy to do street races. Um, because if they're done in the right place, the general public can see what karting is. People can see 10 or 15 or 20,000 people that don't race go-karts can see what it's like for 20 or 30 or 40 go-karts to race through town at nearly 100 miles an hour. That'll bring more people to karting. Um, that'll bring news coverage. And so I think that's something that, that all of us that love the sport, that want to see it grow, I think if we can create events that bring the general public, the racers will like it because 
they want to run, I mean, every racer wants to run in front of spectators. Um, but we'll do ourselves all a favor if we can introduce karting to more people. So that's why it's worth the effort to go out and do some unique events in places where you wouldn't expect a kart race. The truth is, karting's fantastic. Um, it is a great sport. What could you do to improve it? You know, go out and have a friend out. You know, just bring a friend out to the track and, and let somebody else try it. Because the truth is, what we have is awesome. And not many people get to know about it. It's, it is a very enclosed, sort of tight-knit circle. And if everybody in the sport were to just bring out one person to a racetrack uh, and show them what the sport's about and, and let them drive their cart one time, um, it, would, it would unveil the sport to, to the world. Uh, and I think that could be the biggest thing for anyone to do uh, in the sport. Just, just have a friend out. Karting has given so much to so many. It has given some the means to an end. To a lucky few, it has provided a career. To others, it has given emotional highs and the chance to feel the exhilaration of motorsports firsthand. And to everyone involved, if nothing more, it has given incredible weekends at the track spent with family and friends. Racing these carts takes money, and it takes time. But these nimble racing machines offer more than just a way to spend the money you might have burning a hole in your pocket. Karting provides so much. It provides an invaluable asset to families, time together. It provides the avenue to develop relationships, and karting provides life experiences that prove valuable in more ways than just trying to be the next Senna or Schumacher. Karting is a passageway, a road, a first step on the steep ladder to the professional level. But more importantly, it is the purest form of the sport. Karting gives racing enthusiasts the chance to be much more than just a fan. It provides the opportunity to hit the track, grip the steering wheel with your hands, and know just how it feels to become one with the track, the engine, the cart, and the love of motorsport.